All right. Uh, well, hello and welcome. So my name is Chelsea Green and I'm the regional director here at AJ Tutoring for the South Peninsula region. So if you work out of the Palo Alto, Los Altos or Mountain View offices, you may have heard my name. I primarily tutor math and test prep and uh, tomorrow marks my 10 years with AJ. So excited to kind of share about a little bit about what I've learned. Um, and then my co-presenter here. Hello, um, I'm Dr. Naika Bright. I direct our rolling game office. Um, we're part of the Northern Peninsula. So the office is most um, regionally or close are going to be our San Mateo, uh, San Mateo and Burlingame offices. And then across the bay, we do have a few in um, Los, in Lafayette and Danville. I tutor mostly test preparation, K-8, and some of our biology, so some of the STEM subjects as well. Thank you. Perfect. So we've got a jam-packed night for y'all today. We're talking about study skills. How can we help our students integrate the information that they're responsible for in a way that works for both them, our family, all of that stuff. Uh, so we're going to spend a little time talking today about how learning works so we can really explore how to best leverage that. We'll talk about some study skills that are key for our high school students, but also our K-8 students as well. And then we are going to save some time at the end for a Q&A. We expect our presentation to take about an hour and then we'll save those last 15 minutes for a QA. If you have questions throughout the process, you're welcome to put them in the chat. Um, can't guarantee that Nike or I will, will see them right away, but we may be able to respond as we're going, but we will save that time for the QA at the end. Perfect. So I am actually going to pass it over and Nike is going to start us out here. Okay. So before we evolve, the idea is for us to weave through seven principles of learning and then we'll look through the interplay of two models of learning as well. But before we dive into that, I wanted to kind of work from a working model or definition of what learning is. And in this model we're working from, um, learning is defined as a process and that process takes place primarily in the minds of our students. So the only thing that we're best able to do is infer that learning actually has occurred through either the products or performance of our students. Uh, learning itself is something that involves change and that change we hope or expect to unfold over time. Perhaps most importantly, that change um, that is occurring or the learning is not fleeting. We do find that the retained knowledge is something that's able to then influence students thinking and then acting thereafter. And most importantly, oops. Uh, learning is not something done to students, but rather something students themselves do. I often tell my tutors or students themselves that while I can teach you, I can't learn you. And you almost hear grammatically how that's impossible as well. And then in diving in our principles, if we looked at them in chunks, our first set centers around the student themselves and firstly acknowledges the fact that a student's prior knowledge can either help or hinder their learning so much so that here at AJ for example we do offer free diagnostic exams for our test prep students to kind of inform plans thereafter and if we're ever working with an academic student we may typically begin from either a grade level or subject level assessment to go into the rest of that work informed and secondly how students organize that information is going to later influence how they actually learn and then apply that knowledge Perfect. So I want to talk about our first study skill today, and that is memorization. Though when working with my students, I do really like to use the word in, um, internalization instead. I think there's a little bit of a stigma around the word memorization. Nobody wants to just go memorize things. Um, so I think that is like a nice switch we can make. Uh, the first kind of question is, you know, why is this so difficult to do? Why can't we just remember everything perfectly? And unfortunately, it's just not how our brain works. Um, so when working with students, we do always try to remember this forgetting curve. Uh, so as we learn something for the first time, we're gonna that memory is gonna quickly deteriorate and probably drop uh, drop off to the end there. But if we reiterate and we review, we can make the drop off less uh, less steep until we internalize it, you know, forever, forever uh, long we needed it. So let's talk about some skills for memorization that we can use with our students. And these are um, things that we can integrate at home or that a tutor could help your student integrate. So the first one is spaced repetition. It's really just acting on that forget, forgetting curve. We know that if we don't interact with the material, we are gonna forget it. So let's make sure that we're reviewing throughout the process. And we know that our high schoolers can sometimes have trouble and our younger students can have trouble building in this spaced repetition. So as parents, as tutors, we can always help build in that um, the time for that. So maybe we'll talk about some techniques later, but maybe creating a calendar when we're going through and helping them plan for that spaced repetition. 
The next technique uh, is active recall. Let's see if I can get my slides going. Um, and that is a really great thing that we can do with parents, or as parents and as tutors, is we can ask our students questions about what they're learning to help them retain it and make sure it's coming to the forefront of their mind. Obviously, we want their consent and buy-in that we're going to be doing this. We don't want to be just kind of throwing questions at them throughout the entire day. Uh, but this is a great technique to make sure that students can um, retain that information. Mnemonic devices are fantastic, and for me, the sillier the better. So we can help our students develop specific mnemonic devices for them, uh, for whatever their interests are. Uh, I think tutors are great at this. I think parents can also bring in their specific interests. Um, sorry, is someone muted or someone needs to be muted? Um, if you could mute yourself throughout this process, that would be great. We'll have some um, uh, unmute time at the end there. And sorry for the background noise if that's an issue. Um, next up is visualization and association. This is where we start to think about like those mind palaces. Um, this could be a great time to like break up your house in this certain spots. So maybe the kitchen is the chemistry room and we have some chemistry flashcards around. Um, and then when we're in, in the kitchen, we're talking about chemistry mode. Teaching others is a fantastic memorization and internalization device. Uh, if we can build that relationship with our student for them to be able to bring that information and teach it to you, to a sibling, to a neighbor, that can be super powerful. Um, and finally, just a reminder that uh, uh, research shows that physical activity can be really helpful for memorization. So if none of these techniques are going to work in you know, for your specific high schooler or in your relationship, just taking a walk around the block in the middle of their studying with them can be a really productive, um, uh, productive step towards their memorization. And then for students to better or best understand what they should be committing to memory, uh, taking notes is going to be key. Uh, so what they need to know for that class hinders on what they're taking out of the class. And notes should be taken both in class and while students are reading. And in this way, they get a holistic uh, approach to understanding some of the key concepts that are falling out of either a lecture or a content or unit that they're on. And I would um, even venture to say that the most important of these, which is often neglected, is the idea of coming to class prepared. Um, once students, if the next level for them is college, if high school is that preparation for college, one of the expectations once they get to that level is once the syllabus has been given out that they can then use that syllabus to guide how they're preparing coming to each class. And in that way, they're better able to shape how they're taking notes while they're in a lecture that may be going a bit faster than they can actually write everything down. So again, we see here that there's multiple ways that a student can explore taking notes. So this idea of developing these study skills becomes more of an art to where we could try a few things and then after our approaches figure out what works best for that student. Because as we start to ask students to engage in these deeper or higher levels of learning, we find that how they organize this information becomes very important. So if we start from all of these small circles over on the screen as small chunks of information that are coming out of a class, then we hope that through some teachings, going to a teacher's office hours, if they're getting any support in the form of tutoring or self-studying or joining any study groups, we find that in this way, students may then be able to form these kind of superficial connections between small chunks of information. With the hope that with more support, we may begin to see these more sophisticated knowledge organizations. And then when you consider this for August, September, October, and then now November, uh, we start to appreciate how in this third principle that our students' motivation really does determine, direct, and sustain what they're learning. Great. Um, so I wanted to think about how we can sustain that learning. And I think creating a space for expected, effective studying can be super powerful and something that um, families can really help with. So the first thing we want to think about when thinking about an effective study environment is just the space. You know, where are students studying? Studying. We know in um, you know COVID times, a lot of us were working in bedrooms and not ideal places, and we saw a marked decline in the students' engagement in those areas. So if we can find a, a space where students can really focus on their work, can be in work mode, that is super powerful. It doesn't have to be a big space. It can be a desk. It can be a chair. But as long as they have a place where they're communicating to themselves and others that I'm studying right now, super powerful. Uh, next up is supplies. I'm a big office supply person. I know not all students are motivated by this, but if your student is, like making sure that they have the pens that bring them joy to do their notes in, um, 
on one end, it can be kind of, um, it can stop students. Like, you know, we'll hear students who want to like make their notes pretty and, um, you know, will, won't do their notes until they can do it pretty. On the other hand, if a student is using a pencil that's on its last life or on its last legs and is about to fall apart, our notes aren't going to be as, uh, as readable. So making sure that they have those supplies. Uh, you know, now you can, I can attest, we have a lot of students coming in with uh, one big folder or one notebook and they have all of their stuff sho shoved in there. And while the student might not be super uh, open to feedback on their organizational system, if they at least have the supplies, maybe it's an accordion folder, maybe it's a binder for each subject, whatever's going to work for them. Uh, super helpful for making sure that we can organize that information effectively. Then comes organization. Uh, this is again something that a lot of our high schoolers struggle with and so tutors do spend a lot of time helping students organize their digital work, their physical work, their backpack, just making sure that we're setting ourselves up for success to be able to know where the information we need is and be able to quickly find that information when, um, when needed. This one's really tough for our high schoolers, but sleep and nutrition is so important for an effective study environment and also for everything we're gonna talk about today in terms of other study habits. Uh, so any support you can offer your student in terms of uh, making sure that they are sleeping as much as they can and making sure that they have regular cadence for, for eating, great. <laughs> Stress management is um, also key. You know, different students are going to experience stress in different ways, but knowing our students and knowing what um, is stressful for them and making sure that they have skills to be able to deal with that stress can be super helpful in the studying process, in the test taking process that we'll um, talk about in a bit. So I know it's a hard sell with some of our teenagers, but whatever we can do to make sure they, when they're engaging in studying it, they're doing it um, in an effective place and as set up for success as possible, the better. On that, we also want to make sure that we have great communication methods with our, our, our students, if possible. So, um, you know, like I said earlier, the space can communicate that a student is studying. The um, folder system can communicate I'm doing um, test preparation right now or chemistry right now. Um, and so as long as students feel empowered to, you know, communicate when they're studying what they're doing, I think that relationship can really help. Um, I also, yeah, we'll talk about that later, but yeah, communication key there. You are muted, Naika, sorry. <laughs> Apologies. So if we shift it into our next set of principles, they're gonna center around a shift from the student and more along the lines of learning. So much so that the next one is stating or recognizing that mastery itself is gonna require a process through the acquisition, then integration and application of all this new, new knowledge that our students are gaining. And highlights that this goal-directed practice, when coupled with targeted feedback, is the best way to enhance that learning itself. So much so that here at the work we do with our students at AJ, um, we begin with and ask parents to complete out what's called a parent goal form, either by yourself in, or in conjunction with your um, family or student. Once we receive that, we're then able to craft an academic plan. And from there, we are supporting our students with this kind of initial cycle to where we can refine any goals and so forth thereafter in the work that we do with them. And in this model, here we see the impact of setting those realistic expectations for our students. One way could be through those baseline assessments, either from a test prep or uh, an assessment for either their grade level or subject that they're in. And then when we better understand the values that our students bring to the table, uh, we can better see how they influence the level of motivation that is then going to um, provide the engagement of this goal-directed behavior that's ideally supporting the learning that we're hoping um, happens within our students. And then from these goals, perhaps most importantly, we as educators, for example, are better able to direct the practice that we ask our students to go and engage within from that practice or goals, we can then better evaluate the performance and most importantly, shape the feedback that we're giving them. And then if we interplay one more model of learning on top of this, we find that through a cycle of practice and targeted feedback, that practice itself produces performance, which in turn allows for targeted feedback and then guides that further practice. And it's this cycle that we hope students can use to inform their studying that begets the learning that we're hoping they accomplish in the first place. And then what better way to kind of handle or exemplify the juggling of all these tasks than with our test prep students. So here next, we'll talk about some test preparation strategies for your 
test preparation. So yeah, like you, Nika said, kind of the culmination of everything we learn and application of what we're doing here. And there's a lot of strategies to employ. They may be specific to your student's unique class, to their unique uh, uh, teacher learning style, all of that. So the first thing we want to talk about with test preparation is just doing our research. Different teachers want different things. Different schools want different things. So really making sure that the student is um, using their resources like their syllabi, uh, talking to their teacher. You'll um, <laughs> you'll notice that tutors a lot will ask like, what do you know about the format of the test? Multiple choice, free response, because that's going to uh, change how we prepare and how we, you know, how we practice going in. Uh, at the same time, in terms of test pre preparation, we really want to make sure we're planning ahead. Uh, if we have a large assessment coming up, we know that that memorization and that internalization isn't going to happen the night before. So tutors will often help students calendar out weeks in advance how we're going to internalize that those topics. If you're working with an academic tutor right now, you probably got an email the last week about finals and how we're going to start preparing for that. Because with those large assessments, we really do want to make sure that the, the students are planning ahead. This is obviously really difficult for students um, to plan ahead for these big assessments when they have all of these different subjects. So any support that we can offer as families, as tutors, to make sure that they're thinking about all of it and making sure that they're planning in a way that's effective for them is key. Next thing is making your work work for you. I work with a lot of students who come in and say, I had to do the notes like this because this is what my teacher says, and so I'm just reading these notes to study. But as we're studying, we are studying for ourselves. So making sure that we are directing our practice in a way that is helpful for ourselves and that if we have notes that are not serving us, we're redoing our notes or we're taking a different approach to that process. This one can be tough, uh, a tough sell as well, but making sure that when we're going into a test, we are practicing those testing environments. That means not on our bed, not sitting next to our friend, that we're actually taking these things seriously because we know all of the practice that we're gonna do, we don't specifically care about any single question. What we care about is that we've built the mindset to be able to approach test day. Uh, the next thing, and it's one thing, it's, it's my big thing. If the students ever work with me, I think it's super important to plan for accuracy errors. We know that we are humans and our brains don't um, work perfectly. So we know that there are sets of errors that we make most regularly and want to make sure we're planning for that. Um, as a parent, something that I implore people to do, I would truly try to stop describing these things as silly or dumb mistakes and start describing them as accuracy errors. Because what I find is that when we talk about them as like, oh, I got an 85, but it was just silly mistakes, we're excusing the, the behavior. And instead of actually engaging with like, okay, well, what kind of mistakes am I making? Am I making these regularly? Can I make a list going into my assessment to check if I'm making these errors? Um, is a much better process than just, you know, kind of waving it. So key tip there. Uh, and sorry to my students who I keep saying that too. <laughs> um, also want to make sure that going into the test, we are thinking about the environmental factors that we talked about earlier that we're sleeping. I think, unfortunately, it's still very prevalent in high school that students will kind of like brag about pulling all-nighters. And like, we know that that is not setting ourselves up for success. So helping our students remember that uh, sleep, nutrition, uh, study environment, it's all going to be a go a long way on test day and helping them try to avoid cramming. And then in thinking about re retaining our information, I think sometimes students will see the test day as the end. We've done it, we get to move on. But the test, as Naika said, is um, you know kind of a reflection on if we've seen the improvement we want to see and if we've seen the integration of knowledge we want to see. So with each and every assessment, with each and every test, it's really important that we're taking some time to reflect on that test. Even if we did fantastic, awesome, what worked in our study process? What do we want to make sure we're doing? If we didn't do exactly what we're looking for, what changes do we want to make for next time? And what do we need to make sure we remember for our um, finals? And even if it's not working towards a final, you know, what skills did we want to build from this class, from this essay that we can bring on to the rest of our, you know, experience as students? So reflection is key. It is a little bit harder to get students to do, but really, really important. Um, and then last thing I wanted to talk about with test preparation is the kind of mindset going into a test. These tests are a lot high pressure for some of these students. So I um, want to think about kind of where a student might be going into tests. And there's a lot of different matrices or, you know, a lot of different axes we could think about um, and influences of a student's mindset going into the test. But when working with students, I find 
there's kind of two that play in key here. So one is like how high or th their energy level. So are they a really high energy, really low energy? And one is how positive or negative they're feeling. Um, I'll notice that a lot of my students will come in in the high energy negative section. So they're feeling really nervous. Oops. Uh, they're feeling really anxious about this test. And they're trying to get down into this low energy positive. They're like, I want to be chill going into the test. I want to be feel good about it. And that's awesome. We can work towards that. But it's going to be far easier to get just one quadrant over into this high energy positive. So could we go from nervous to excited? And maybe it's just saying, I'm excited for this test. It can be a lie the first time. It can be a lie the first hundred times. But if we're thinking about how can I change my energy to this positive state, I think super helpful and has really helped a lot of my students. I'm also, you know, trying to remember with my students that, you know, if we're high energy negative, if we're low energy negative, just neutral is fine, right? Like if we just need to get to the origin here. If we need to get to the center, that's totally fine. As long as we're trying to move out of those uh, negatives so that we're not losing points to, um, you know, to those nerves, to those worries. Okay. <laughs> and then next thing, I guess when managing time and then busy schedules, it may be helpful at some point to look ahead. So if we here have a typical student from middle through high school, um, if middle school is more of this period of refining content, and if we're starting early enough exploring what strategies may work for a student that they can carry into that next level, eighth graders may have to grapple with private school admissions. But we find that as they enter into high school, not so many demands test prep wise. So this reflection here is mostly on the tests that a student can take throughout their career. The demands start to increase um, perhaps the most with our juniors that year being the most important in getting that initial first round of any test a student may have identified to get into college to where coming out of the PSAT most recently, some of our students are considering, should I retake a paper pencil test before or retake potentially with a new shift into a format digitally with the SAT is another kind of layered thing to consider and maybe added stress for our students in this day and age to where we could then start exploring once we have this kind of meta focus to shifting into some resources that a student could use to manage their time. So if we started at the top or bottom of a day with some type of inventory, um, that could then help a student maybe prioritize the to-dos they're listing for a specific day. The next two kind of help with the idea of developing self-advocacy. And then as Chelsea mentioned, these setting aside periods or times for reflection will help a student better shape or adjust all these skills that we're asking them to juggle along their careers, such that then keeping track of everything they must um, plan for for a day or get uh, turned in or any extracurriculars using a weekly planner could be a, a great way to track that coupled with uh, again we saw how in, um, instrumental goals are in allowing for that motivation to be focused so those goals can be set on a semester wide all the way down to daily goals and if we mimic what that process could look like Say for a student this fall, they had writing goals and most specifically, they wanted to start expressing a clear stance as a concise thesis statement. So maybe they've gotten feedback from their, say, freshman year and they want to get better at um, developing a stance. <clears throat> so three things they could have decided early on in the fall, either by themselves or shaping goals with the tutor could be to annotate reflect and then write all semester most importantly writing from their annotations after they're able to reflect on are there any themes to the things that stood out to me as significant from that piece and then from there if we shifted from the semester into say uh, a weekly planner here we have a sample planner that it's funny the first time i gave a blank planner to one of my first study skills students they actually turned it into all these colors this isn't the exact same plan but color coding could help kind of chunk up where their days are being spent i like most importantly or at the very least getting a student to understand how much free time they actually have in a day and in that way setting aside time as this student has for both homework and then understanding that homework and studying are two separate entities. So if we notice here that on the weekends, they devoted time to just this open study versus throughout the week getting homework and then smaller chunks of studying done throughout the week. So then when a student has a better sense of what their week looks like, they can then better grapple on a daily to-do list. So say it's now two weeks before final paper is due and on a Monday, they wanna actually find their stance before looking for the evidence and so forth. 
And then say in a seven hours in a typical afternoon for say a student, they may begin by coming home and just simply collecting resources, take an hour to slowly collect all of those into wherever their environment conduces them for studying for the day. And then they can slowly go through the next hour where all they're merely doing is reorganizing those annotations and they're just pondering and looking for themes. That probably takes a lot of mental effort. So maybe building in a break before going into the actual brainstorming or outlining of their thoughts. Here, I like to mention on a sheet of paper, um, literally getting those thoughts out of their head so they can see them. And in that way, they can better pick a stance from their own thoughts. And then it seems maybe less daunting to then write a sample or an actual statement in an hour. And in the realm of if study skills very much are an art, developing that art or exploring what works best for your students, there are also going to be a host of digital time management apps that we've included um, icons here and then we'll give you the links to thereafter. Um, so exploring what would work best if it's a, a handwritten planner, maybe it's coupled with some type of digital app could be a way to refine what works best for your student. And then in our last chunk of principles, we look at the growth centered around all of the ideas that have been presented to where we acknowledge firstly that all of this is occurring within a human being. So we must kind of consider both or maybe the social, emotional and intellectual climate of either the courses that our students are in, the day to day that they come to us in our tutoring sessions with along their journey of most importantly becoming the self-directed learners. Again, with the idea of reflection, allow, uh, reflection times to allow for them to monitor and then adjust their approaches to learning. Great, so as we adjust those approaches to learning, I um, want to talk about generalization and application. So how do we make all this information that we're responsible fit together? The first thing, and we'll just say it again, it's really about reflection. Like if we can get our students to think about what they're doing, how they're doing it, how it's working for them, it's gonna make the um, information gathering and retention so much easier. Again, hard sell for a high schooler, but the more we can do to encourage them to do this, the better. Uh, the next thing we find is really helpful in tutoring is leveled questions. So once a student has ma mastered a topic, making sure that we're upgrading that question so they can apply that in a more difficult way or synthesize with other information. Uh, this is something that you know tutors are well um, well situated to do, but I find that a lot of students, you know, if they're working at home, don't really understand how their textbooks work. Um, and so, as parents, we can help them guide through that that textbook of you know, okay, your teacher assigned let's say one through fifteen or whatever it is. I noticed that these questions are a little harder. Let's apply uh, what we've learned onto those, um, and they will you know get that level of question in there. Um, they can also you know great exercise is asking them, okay, well you know you have this question. How, what is a harder question? Uh, how can we apply what we've learned to a harder question? And I love having students write questions because it gets them into that reflection mode as well. Um, on the other end of level question, questioning, making sure that we're backing up if we need to um, go down a little bit and do a little bit more fundamentals before going to that the question that's been assigned. Again, I find that students um, don't really use their textbooks much, so making sure that if they are having trouble with one question, can we find examples? Can we find a slightly easier um, application either in our textbook or on you know, some sort of website like that? So fantastic way to uh, make sure students are applying that. Uh, next up is world real world explanations. As a math tutor, I get asked a lot, why do we need this? Uh, my answer has changed over the 10 years. I really do think that uh, learning in high school is really about learning how to learn. But I do also think that we can really get students buy-in if we can find these applications to things that they're interested in and their long-term success. This requires having kind of, uh, you know, ideas of what they want to do long term and very difficult for a high schooler. But as a family, we can definitely be exploring those questions um, so that they can kind of fine tune what they're looking at in terms of real world questions for their interests. Uh, mind maps are incredibly helpful as we get all of this information together as we approach final season A mind map for the, the year can be uh, super helpful. This could be, we'll talk about some apps later that are helpful for it. But honestly, just if the student has like a whiteboard or a big piece of paper, encouraging them to put everything they know down so we can see if there are any gaps and get that all out, uh, it's super helpful. Really love project-based learning as some of the schools are set up to do this. Um, but if they're not, summer can be, summer and winter break are really great times to see like, is there a way we can apply what we learned in our computer science class to bring something? Or do we want to write an essay? 
uh, something like that, to get the students buy-in and get them using the skills in a way that's real world without being, you know, kind of a, a smaller real world question. Uh, and then community-based learning. Um, a really great way, again, to fit all this information together is making sure that the student is engaging with it with other people. So maybe that's teaching it back to you or teaching it back to their siblings. Maybe it's joining French club if they're trying to learn French. Uh, whatever it is, if we can build a community around their studies, super helpful. So giving them that, that opportunity to do those. I think tutors are a great community, but I also really love um, when students can engage with their peers and their, their families on the, the information that they're learning. And then in this art of defining these study skills for our students, our biggest recommendation for our, our middle school students is to start early. Um, and in that way, you have more time to explore the options, allowing for a refinement of work works best for that student, for maybe that type of class, adjusting for various classes and scenarios. And then middle school with a set of principles, when they get to high school, they're better able to just refine, adjust, and then hopefully towards the later half of their high school career, solidify those stances or approaches that work for them, such that by the time, if they are heading to college, when they're freshmen in college, they now know what works for them and they can take that into their first freshman class, as opposed to in the realm of the newness of college, also exploring how to grapple with all the autonomy that they now have to be successful in each of their classes. Great. Okay. Well, we actually went a little faster than we expected. So wanted to talk about some helpful resources. And I think this slide is also a fantastic reminder of kind of the main uh, study skills that we're thinking about. Obviously, for your, your unique student, they might have um, deficiencies and strengths in each of these or in other additional study skills. But just kind of the main things we want to be thinking about with students is how are they managing their time? How are they taking notes? How are they internalizing their information? How are they reflecting and generalizing that information? And then also at the end of the day, what are they doing to prepare for tests? So we put a few apps here. I think for me with apps, I think students get really excited about apps. So if it's something that like brings them joy, let's go for it. My rule is always it has to work for you. So if after two weeks it's not working, let's try something else, right? Let's experiment to make sure that our study skills are uniquely working for our student because what works for one student will not work for the next. And also what works for one student in one class or in one year uh, may need to be adapted in other things. So just some kind of key um, apps here, just like general usefulness, making sure that the student has somewhere where they're keeping their to-dos. I personally love Todoist. It's very nice, it's very pretty, but you know, a Google Doc with the information, any sort of checklist can be super helpful, as long as it's something that they have access to. I, you know, a students of mine have kept really pretty planners that I absolutely adore and they love, but then they leave it at home and now we don't know what they need. So making sure that it's something that they constantly have access to, that they're constantly updating. Uh, and then the kind of hard balance is making sure that it's something that isn't overwhelming to them. So, you know, for me with Todoist, sometimes it can be like, you can see like three years of tasks and maybe that's a little too much. So making sure it works for them. Uh, I will call out Forest here. I think we noticed that a lot of students have trouble um, sticking on their uh, or sorry, not or staying off of their phone while studying. So Forest is a to-do app that um, like has the, like you, you grow the little tree while you're on the app. So if you go out of it, your tree starts to die. Um, and just a reminder to keep studying. I also, it's right in front of me. I do love these kind of visual timers. I like, we're gonna focus for this many minutes. Uh, just a nice reminder to stay on task there and communicate when you're gonna be off task. Note taking really depends on the student. Um, we put two here, just want them to be simple and accessible. Again, um, if the teachers or if the school has a specific way they want to note taken, awesome, but let's make sure that we have a version of our notes that are really working for us and that we're assessing that. Uh, in terms of memorization, Quizlet's fantastic. We also absolutely love just uh, you know handwritten note cards, super helpful. Um, I would just say that uh, I have seen that note cards just kind of jammed in the bottom of backpacks. So when we are making note cards, making sure that they're things that are gonna be used for, for a while, super helpful to just take a hole punch in the corner and then just put a ring in them. And then you are like, this is my chapter four note cards. These are my chapter five note cards and we can come back to them when possible. And then in terms of general education application, there are so many great resources for challenge problems, for real life examples. We put a few here. Um, MindMeister is also a great way to do a digital mind map if that's something your student's interested in. But again, I think some of them do just love big whiteboard, big piece of paper, have it all written out. Um, and then in terms of test preparation, there's a lot of you know quiz apps, all of that kind of stuff that you can use. 
but really we think the key to test preparation is planning ahead. So I put just a calendar here, make sure that you're thinking ahead uh, and that we have our studying clocked in. And then uh, I really like calm. You can see nice, uh, nice stories to keep uh, students calm going into a test. I have a few students who, you know, before going into test will listen to some sort of meditation or their favorite song uh, to get them in that, that mindset. Perfect. Okay, well that actually concludes our um, content. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop uh, recording, but if you'd like to stick around, we'd be happy to answer questions again. Um, but if you are heading out now, just.